I just as of recently came across an article of, if not my favorite, one of my favorite higher yielding income focused cover call style ETFs. The ETF I'm talking about, of course, is SPYI and Nicholas B on SeekingAlpha.com broke down how SPYI could be a potential asset that offers high income and capital appreciation. The title of this article is SPYI, High Income and Capital Appreciation. You can have both. Now, this article starts off by saying SPYI is a strong income investment choice in the cover call option ETF arena, offering predictable and tax efficient income with, with upside capability. And at this point, it feels like I've talked about more or less every single cover call style higher yielding ETF across the entire space. And honestly, because of what SPY offers, the strategy, which we're going to go over here in a second, this ETF makes a great argument on why it should be a perfect position long-term, at least in my portfolio. Now, through a detailed back test withdrawal 8% annually, with dividends partially reinvested, achieved a balance between income and inflation adjusted returns. Risks like performance history and capital preservation are assessed and what you can do to manage the risks. And like I talked about, this article which is too good to pass up. We have to go over this together. Nicholas then said, how much money is enough? What makes you feel more secure? $2 million in the bank or $10,000 per month for the rest of your life. In my pursuit of financial security, I'm constantly faced with the net worth versus cash flow debate. And a lot of investors alike are always talking about what's better off having a massive balance of cash and then slowly draw it down or investors like myself that are currently trying to live off a dividend income potentially in the future. Investors on social media debate growth versus dividends frequently. Income investing is even more taboo unless you're in the 60 year old plus crowd. As I've studied challenge and improved my personal finances and investments, I learn more about what I want out of life than about finance. Money is not intrinsically valuable. It's a tool to exchange goods, services, and of course your time. The most important there, your time. Balancing growth and income is key to providing a robust cash flow. What makes funds like SPYI so attractive to income investors is undoubtedly its high yield, which currently sits around 11% more or less. But the fund has several other positive features, making it a strong investment vehicle option in addition to just the high yield, SPYI also offers predictable monthly income because more or less, at least since inception, this ETF has paid around 47 to 49 cents more or less every single month on time. Now also tax efficiency, which is very important to some investors and active strategy to manage the NAV or the net asset value. To achieve a predictable monthly income, the fund sells cash settled European style options using SPX indexed options. Additionally, the fund management has a goal to distribute 1% per share each month as shown below. So as of right now, where SBYI is currently trading at, at more or less 50 bucks per share, it has a distribution yield of around 12% in a trailing 12 month of just under 12%. The predictability of the monthly income is one of the most important anchors for forward-looking asset assessments of SPYI. Knowing that the target of 1% per share allows investors to predict their distributions, which has been one of my favorite things about buying shares of SPYI on a consistent basis, knowing that I most likely, not for sure, most likely will be getting that every single month keeps me extremely motivated to get more and more shares of this ETF specifically in my portfolio. Now the fund layers tax efficiency strategy with several methods. The contracts sold are taxed at 60% by 40% long short-term capital gains taxed respectively per section 1256 contracts. Part of the fund earns qualified dividends from equities held, utilization of a tax loss harboring of course, and it uses ROC or return of capital classification on the distributions, which essentially makes around 90% of distributions deferred as long-term capital gains. Now, a case for the 8% rule, this is where it gets interesting. I've been building a dividend growth and income portfolio to fully offset my emergency fund and to cover my fixed expenses, which are about $2,600 per month. Now, using the 4% rule, he would need to invest around $780,000 to cover the fixed expenses, such as things like subscriptions, phones, insurance, water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are expenses that will never go away, even if you are debt-free, but with SPYI, you would only need to invest, at least theoretically, $260,000 using the current 12% distribution yield or what else. There's no point in using the 4% rule, otherwise you would simply invest the underlying holdings in SPDR, the S&P 500, or SPY. However, in my experience and analysis, I don't believe it's wise to take the full distribution from SPYI and cover call ETF in general. However, there's something called the 8% rule, which the idea is to structure an income portfolio with investments which provide a reliable and predictable yield, usually somewhere around 8 to 10%. Regardless of market conditions, cover call ETFs are one such investment a part of the group. And it is certainly less mainstream and more recently of a highly controversial take by Dave Ramsey when he bashed the 4% rule on The Ramsey Show. Now in the table that we see right here, it says that I compare SPYI's average distribution each year, the income growth and the average inflation rate. Although the distributions have grown above 2%, inflation is not always 2% each year. 
as we've seen recently, we've seen over the last few years, it's been much higher. Cumulatively, the distribution increases has been around 4.56% versus 5.17 for inflation. Therefore, I believe taking a 12% distribution leaves too little margin for your income to keep up with the rate of inflation. But next, I back-tested SPYI from January 23 to April 24, assuming an investment of 300000 to have some buffer for my income requirements, withdrawal a monthly percentage based off of an annualized withdrawal rate, and dividends reinvested according to the difference in the withdrawal rate. If you withdraw 8%, you're reinvesting 4% of the distribution. With this setup, we can study the performance of the investment in a realistic way an income investor would actually use the fund. Of note, I used Jan 23 and not the inception date of September 2022 in order to compare distribution growth versus inflation rates. Now in the chart above, I plotted the annualized withdrawal rate versus the annual cash flow on the primary y-axis and inflation adjusted CAGR on the secondary y-axis. Two things stood out to me, using a 6% or 8% withdrawal rate does not achieve my income goal of $2,600 per month and a withdrawal rate of 12%, i.e. not reinvesting dividends, result in a negative real return of minus 0.86%. Note that the 12% value in the table chart was rounded from the trailing yield over the time frame without dividends reinvested. Now this was done to see how the investment would have held up based on price performance alone, taking the full distribution and seeing if your income would still grow. So in conclusion, Nicholas said, all in all, I'm intrigued by SPYI and NEO's NASDAQ 100 high income ETF, which is QQQI, which I've also talked about. For that matter, as strong income investments, the predictable monthly income, tax efficiency, and capital appreciation strategy makes for a strong income investment choice. And what's also great about this is it doesn't require saving millions and millions of dollars to pay certain fixed expenses that you can't escape. I believe in a realistic income investing strategy is investing into both SPYI and QQQI, which he wrote about recently. And utilizing the 8% rule to cover the fixed expense needs, reinvesting the difference back into the fund, which could definitely be a good option and a good strategy long term. Now, for me personally, in my long-term portfolio, I still like to have a mix of growth assets and income-oriented assets. And throughout the rest of this year, I'm definitely going to be building out my QQQI position as well as SPYI. And of course, adding more shares to my JEPQ position of 508 shares as well. But lastly, most importantly, now I want to hear from you guys down below. When it comes to building out positions like SPYI, like Nicholas talked about in that article, if you're currently building out a position, an income-oriented position to cover some of your fixed expenses, which stocks or ETFs are you doing it with? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to please drop a like and subscribe for more future content like this. Real quick for those that haven't already, make sure to go to the first link in my description and grab my new dividend investing ebook where I share exactly how I went from $0 invested to now earning over $6,000 on a monthly basis and over $1 million invested in the market. Along with the ebook, you're also going to receive my custom dividend tracker where you can track your dividend progress on an ongoing basis and reach your dividend investing goals. So make sure to grab yourself a copy of my dividend investing ebook and the new dividend tracker today. It's the first link in my description. Thanks as always for stopping by and if you you are interested in investing, make sure to check out these recent videos I posted right here.